Thank you for your interest in the Jason Foundation, Inc. and our programs for awareness and prevention of youth suicide. All of the Jason Foundation's programs have been designed to follow the guidelines of our mission statement, dedicated to the prevention of the silent epidemic of youth suicide through educational and awareness programs that equip young people, educators, youth workers, and parents with the tools and resources to help identify and assist at-risk youth. Since the time these materials were produced, our affiliates, community partners, etc. may have changed, bringing more diversity and support to JFI. For an up-to-date list of our supporters, please visit the JFI website, www.jasonfoundation.com. Also, statistical information supplied in these programs may be different from when the programs were filmed. For updated national and state statistics, please visit the Centers for Disease Control website, www.cdc.gov. You will find a wealth of knowledge about suicide, and specifically youth suicide, on their website. If you are facilitating a presentation using the enclosed materials, please share the above information with your audience. Periodically, we may add a section to the video supplying updates. Again, thank you for joining us in the fight against youth suicide. My name is Scott Poland. I'm really delighted to be here to talk about some very important issues and to represent the Jason Foundation and to be here with my partner, Rich Lieberman. We've worked through a lot of tragic school crisis situations together, and we both believe very strongly in prevention. And you know, with regards to suicide, so many Americans have been touched by suicide. Sadly, my own father shot himself at the age of 53. I was a graduate student at the time, probably a good example of a family that just didn't think it could actually, something like a suicide could happen in our family. And today we're gonna to talk about bullying and suicide. And I worked in the schools in Texas for 26 years. And I'd have to be honest in telling you that I didn't really recognize how prevalent bullying was, nor did I recognize the impact. And even though I wrote my first book, Suicide Intervention in the Schools as far back as 1989, and have subsequently written four more, it wasn't really until the last couple of years that I realized there is a strong relationship between bullying and suicide. We're gonna to begin today and look at some of the facts, some of the misperceptions about bullying and suicide. And bullying, as we know, it really peaks in middle school. And basically, somewhere around 25% of all middle school students in this country will say that they have, in fact, been bullied. And we could spend a lot of time talking about the complexities of cyberbullying. And you know, when I was a child, you went home, it was a safe haven. No one could reach you. That's not the way it is today with all of the social media, the texting, and just all the ways that somebody can post something that is going to be very hurtful to you. 
And one of the most important things to talk about is why is it that about one third of the time the kids that are the victims of even severe bullying, they don't tell an adult? And when you ask them, they say, oh, I didn't think the adults could do anything. I was afraid it would only get worse. And what we have to have in our schools and our communities, the kids that are being victimized, they must reach out and give the adults a chance to hopefully take some steps to prevent what is happening to them. So bullying is extremely pervasive, and I think everyone will acknowledge that around the country. The question of do we have the right statistics about the problem of suicide? Are kids today under far more pressure than ever before? Are guns too available to them? Is the media part of the problem because they sensationalize when a suicide occurs? And what is the role of schools? And you know, all those things were initially clarified in a conference in Vienna, Austria in the year 1910. And Sigmund Freud actually conducted that conference. Obviously, we are more than 100 years later. And I'd have to honestly say, the progress in suicide prevention has been slow. And it has been tremendous advances with the work of the Jason Foundation, with the issue of depression screening, with national goals being set for suicide prevention. We have progress, but all of those factors that were identified so long ago, they're really still present and part of our challenges. There are a number of myths about bullying. First of all, the idea that bullies are powerless. They're actually very powerful. They're calculating. They often get what they want. Sometimes they even have increased popularity as a result of being the bully in their school. The idea that everybody that is a bully has been abused in some way or mistreated, that's more likely to happen for those that are the victims of bullying. So other really important things to look at are we initially thought that the impact of bullying was pretty short term. I've actually had people say to me, oh, come on, Scott, what's the big deal? I mean, bullying's a part of life. It's a rite of passage. And are we only now realizing the effects of bullying aren't short term? They can actually last for decades. And sometimes parents will say to a kid, oh, if you're bullied, I want you to fight back. I want you to strike back. I want you to be physical. And that's really not a good strategy in today's world. It's about social assertiveness. It's about bystanders, people stepping forward and let the bullies know, we don't appreciate this. This is not what we want to have in our school and the importance of getting the adults involved. And we'd like to think that people would outgrow bullying, but that's not true for everyone. In fact, there's a lot of concern that there's actually even bullying in the workplace today, bullying that is done by adult. So, and it's not just the school's problem to solve. It's really a societal problem. And it really takes everybody, from the principal to the teachers, to the custodian, to the parents, to the community, and to the students themselves. And there are a number of really very dangerous myths about suicide that have been perpetuated. First of all, it is not destiny. It is not inherited. It's not something that happens, has to happen in families. And I believe really strongly, a family that's experienced a suicide, the more they talk about it, the more they support each other, the more they recognize mental health issues and problems like alcoholism, the less chance that it will be repeated in a family. Sometimes people say there were no warning signs. The suicide occurred without any warning at all. And most of the time, there was always something. In fact, often some pretty dramatic warning signs of giving away prized possessions, dramatic changes in behavior, verbal and written statements about suicide. You see, we have to have a society where somebody recognizes something is wrong. If I were to take off my watch right now and give it to somebody, you need to be thinking, why would Scott never need to tell the time again? What is he trying to tell us through his actions? Sometimes the comment will be made, oh, there's no relationship between bullying and suicide. There is a strong association. We're going to talk about that a lot today. And then one of the most prevalent 
misperceptions is that if we talk about it with young people, somehow we're going to make them think about it for the first time, and sometimes the suicide will happen just because we talked about it. Our young people are facing countless friends, classmates, and peers who talk about suicide, who attempt suicide. And what we really need to do is to talk about them, with them about what to look for, what to do, how do you help yourself, and how do you help your friend. National Crisis Hotline, 1-800-SUICIDE, something that we wish every young person in America would know. And almost all young people today have cell phones. Many of them have an Apple phone. You push the button, you talk to Siri, and you say, I want to kill myself. Siri responds by saying, may I connect you with the National Crisis Hotline? So we need to make sure that everybody is aware of all of these resources. Then there's the concern and the question, what's the relationship between suicide and self-injury? Most commonly, cutting burning, pinching, and there is a relationship. And that is one of the modules we will be completing for the Jason Foundation. Now, I want to give you an example of a middle school student. And this middle school student had a psychiatric history. He had been diagnosed with multiple problems. Everybody who knew him said he walked funny. He spoke with a lisp. He had a very bad skin rash on his face. He identified as gay and Buddhist. What do you think would, like, would be like for a middle school student that has all those physical characteristics and has the sexual orientation of being gay and the religious orientation of being Buddhist? I argued in this particular case, this young man should have stood out the moment he walked into the school as someone being extremely likely to be the victim of bullying. I've actually had personnel in schools say things like, oh, we have no bullying here. Well, let's go back to what the federal government tell us. 25 to 30% of all middle school students report they've been the victim of bullying. I would argue this is the kid that should have been the one out of 100 that stood out as the most likely target. So what do we know about bullying and suicide? Children that have been bullied have a variety of behavioral, emotional problems. Often they have insecurity and they have anxiety. And the bottom line, these are the very same kids that are likely to be depressed and suicidal. We do know that suicide is the second leading cause of death for our high school population, the fourth leading cause of death for our middle school population. We've had an increase in suicide with both of those age groups. Positive association between bullying and suicide. Earlier I talked about those young people that did not seek out adult help. And one of the things I'm really big on is what I like to call the fourth R, not just reading, writing, and arithmetic. The fourth R is relationships. And the point is, does every student going to a school in this country sincerely believe somebody cares whether they show up today at school or not? And do they have a trusted adult in that school that they would go to? And one of my favorite activities in a classroom is to have kids identify the trusted adults in their world at school, at home, and in the community. And obviously, we'd be very concerned when there are very few or no adults they actually feel like they could go to. And we know these positive interactions between adults and schools are going to do a lot to improve school climate and to reduce the impact of bullying. So creating connections is a critical element. You know, Abraham Maslow had it right. He talked about the foundation of that pyramid for every single one of us, which is safety, security, having our physical needs taken care of, and that sense of belonging. And one of the early theorists about suicide, a guy by the name of Durkheim basically had a very complicated word that he coined, anami, that basically says, when we have a suicide in our school or community, we've all failed. We've failed 
to have a connection with that person. And we have a lot of national initiatives that focus on building those connections. There is some debate about what is the, you know, the best or the absolute definition of bullying. But bullying is repetitive. Bullying is humility. Bullying is all about power. It might involve verbal things. It might involve physical things. It might involve spreading rumors. But the bottom line is somebody has all the power and somebody does not. And perhaps the most famous person about studying bullying around the world is from Norway, a gentleman by the name of Oveus. And why did Oveus get so involved in bullying prevention? A number of middle school students in Norway died by suicide. And bullying was to be believed to be a very major factor. We need to be alert to bullying. And having worked in schools for all those years, Sometimes I would ask a kid, well, did you tell your teacher what was happening out there? Oh, yeah, I told her. What would she tell you? She said, stay away from those boys. Well, if they ride your bus, they go to the playground the same time you do, staying away from the boys is not going to be a very easy thing for you to do. And what do we really need to do as adults? We need to stop the bullying when it's happening. We can't walk by and pretend that we didn't know what was going on. We have to have consequences for the bully, and we have to have support for the person that is the victim. But a teacher will sometimes say something like this, I'm only one person. I've got five minutes between classes. How can I possibly provide the consequences for the bully and support the victim? Oh, and I'm supposed to make it a teachable moment for the bystanders as well. And it's all about training. And a really great thing is that virtually every state in this country has passed legislation requiring bullying prevention in schools that does include training. And obviously, the more frequently you're the victim of bullying, the more pervasive the effects are going to be. So earlier, I made the statement that the children that are the victims of bullying are very likely to be the ones that are anxious depressed, and insecure. And you know, our Secret Service had important studies after school shootings that came out. The first time they released that report was 2000. Unfortunately, the schools didn't pay very much attention, so they released it again in 2002 with some updated statistics. And they found that two-thirds of the school shooters were the victims of bullying. They also found that two-thirds of our school shooters were also suicidal. You know what I naively thought? OK, every school is going to realize bullying prevention is critically important, and they're going to realize suicide prevention is critically important. Now, over the next decade, thankfully, schools did recognize the importance of bullying prevention. However, they did not really recognize suicide prevention. And perhaps the simplest message I have today is, Yes, it's wonderful you have a bullying prevention program. You also need a suicide prevention program. The Jason Foundation can help you with that. And please recognize the kids that are involved in bullying might also be suicidal. What's the research say? There have been a number of studies. And to basically try to summarize those relatively quickly, the studies all found a positive association between bullying and suicide, not causation. Can you think how complicated it would be to rule out all the other factors that might have to do with family, losses, poverty, all kinds of issues that children face? So strong association. That association is actually the strongest when somebody is what termed the victim perpetrator. So what do I mean by that? They're the perpetrator of bullying in some situations. In other situations, they are the victim. So a number of studies have found this strong association. In fact, that prompted the Suicide Prevention Resource Center to publish a brief about bullying and suicide. Again, strong association. They are at high risk 
for suicide. And again, repeating some of those personal characteristics that cause a child to be anxious, depressed, lacking in problem-solving skills, those also make them a likely target for bullying. So we've got to make this connection. Strong association, can't really determine proximal cause or causation. So what's the real port point for a person in working in education? If you know that somebody is the victim of bullying, don't hesitate to talk to them about, have you thought about giving up? Have you thought about ending your life? Do you have a plan? So very important that we're comfortable having those conversations. And most important that we realize we're not going to plant the idea in a student's head. In fact, if anything, they're relieved that somebody gives them the opportunity to talk about these thoughts that they have been having. Now, there are a number of parents that feel really strongly the bullying caused the suicide of their child. Let me quote one of those parents for you. They killed her. They killed her as surely as if they climbed in her bedroom window and stabbed her to death. But again, almost impossible to rule out all those other factors. And I've come to conclude that a severe bullying incident might be the precipitating event. The young person has thought about suicide before, but now because of this extreme humiliation, something was posted that was very negative on one of the social media sites, and 302 people post their agreement with this really derogatory comment. That just might be the straw that broke the camel's back and caused the young person to follow through on their earlier thought out suicidal plans. And one of the things I want to be honest today, and one of our greatest challenges is supporting gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth. And I worked in the Texas schools for a very long time. I was there recently, and somebody in a big crowd said, OK, what do you wish you would have done better? What didn't you do well enough? I said, well, let me answer honestly. We didn't support the GLBTQ youth. We didn't do it enough. And you're wondering, why didn't we? Basically, the superintendent told us, this is not what we're going to deal with in schools. And thankfully, today, we have a growing movement to recognize that those youth, GLBTQ, are very much at risk for suicide and suicide attempts and suicide deaths. And across their nation, we're a very diverse nation. Part of the message that Rich and I are going to give today will go over much better in certain parts of our country than it will go over in other parts. But we have to embrace and support all of these young people. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Rich Weirun. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, I, I too want to thank the Jason Foundation for the opportunity to present with my good friend, colleague, Scott. Every time Scott speaks, I learn something. So it's always a pleasure. And I also want to commend the Jason Foundation for this module because actually we are recording here in October and it's National Bully Prevention Month. So I think it's a wonderful way to honor uh, bully prevention programs and efforts in the schools. Um, like Scott, I'm a school psychologist, and I've been a school psychologist for 40 years. Now, for 25 of those years, I coordinated the suicide prevention program that was in place in the over 1,200 schools covering the 800,000 students of Los Angeles Unified School District. So just to give you a little perspective, I had more children in my schools than the amount of people that live here in Nashville. So it's quite, it was quite a challenge. And to the credit of the school district, they supported a suicide prevention program in 1986 is when we started, when suicide had become the third leading cause for high school kids, um, the third leading cause of death for high school kids in America. Um, 
The other thing about Los Angeles Unified School District is since the beginning, we had suicide prevention, bully prevention, and violence prevention are all components of our comprehensive uh, school safety plan. So each division working very closely with each other and collaborating and what you will hear uh, a lot of today in terms of directions for school personnel is the very first thing is schools need to have um, comprehensive uh, policies and procedures on how to respond when bullying takes place, when a child is referred uh, as being potentially suicidal or as being one who may potentially harm someone else in school violently. Um, Scott mentioned some of the research in bullying prevention and just to summarize, uh, the perpetrator and the victim, one who has been both the perpetrator and the victim, um, has uh, been associated with the highest uh, suicide referrals and the highest risk. Um, we don't want to eliminate one factor, and that is in this child, there also very likely was a pre-existing mental health issue uh, that uh, was exacerbated uh, during a time of crisis. There is inconclusive evidence about gender and bullying. However, I did find a study that was very interesting to me that found differences in the profiles between boys and girls. It appeared in this study that girls were at greatest risk with any level of bullying, whether the bullying was occasional or whether the bullying was frequent. But when they looked at boys, they found just significance if a boy suffered uh, frequent bullying. It seemed that in this study that infrequent bullying kind of contributed to boys building resilience. And when I saw that, <clears throat> I kind of flashed back on my own childhood. Um, you may not recognize it because I lost my accent a long time ago. <laughs> but I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And I was not always the buff dude you see before you today. And I really hate that that joke works. But you can imagine what I looked like when I was 13 years old. And I was walking around Brooklyn, and I definitely was a victim of occasional bullying. Um, but when I looked at back at how I learned to react, there were some times I learned to react to just walk on by and ignore the person. There were times I learned that I could diffuse situations with a sense of humor. There were times when I felt I needed to build alliances. Scott talked about connectedness at school. Building alliances with like some very big guys. <laughs> that helped. Sometimes I would fight back and sometimes I would run. So it was very interesting um, <clears throat> that I learned ways of coping. But it's very clear in the literature that no matter what, um, all kids are affected by frequent bullying, particularly LGBT. Now, you've heard Scott refer to GLBT because he is on the East Coast, I am on the West Coast, and uh, we generally use the acronym LGBT. But we are talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth. I am often asked if being gay is a natural risk factor for suicide, and I am not convinced. As a matter of fact, groundbreaking research has come out through the Family Acceptance Project and the work of Caitlin Ryan. And what Caitlin Ryan uh, found in her research is that when gay kids grow up in nurturing homes and affirming environments, they have no greater risk than their heterosexual peers. And I found that to be absolutely fascinating. But do gay kids grow up in nurturing homes and in um, uh, nurturing environments? For many, absolutely not. The key factors appear to be two, parental rejection as well as peer victimization. So let's take a look at just the cost of family rejection. The research showed that if uh, a gay child was cast out from their family, they had 
more than an eight times greater risk to be at risk for suicidal attempts or suicidal thoughts. Close to 6% had developed a history of depression. You see the other risk factors on the slides, but the two that concerned me the most in Los Angeles were homelessness because many of our kids were living on the street, middle school kids cast out of their home living on the street, and think of all the complications that they deal with, violence, alcohol, and drug abuse, depression. Where are they going to sleep? Where are they going to find any kind of support? Um, and inevitably, this leads to high rates of school dropouts, and then we can't reach them at all. One of the agencies uh, the networks that exist in America is GLSEN. It's the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. And we turn to GLSEN because they do a, a national study, um, a school climate study. And when they asked LGBTQ students nationwide um, how many have heard gay used in a negative word, almost three out of four kids responded. Over 60% heard other forms of homophobic comments. Um, almost 60% heard comments, negative comments about gender, um, and 52% heard uh, homophobic remarks from school staff. Think of how harmful that is as well. You'll see a small little uh, link on this slide that will take you to uh, nohomophobes.com. And nohomophobes.com actually tracked Twitter and what they will do is isolate how many times certain uh, comments, negative comments, are made. And you watch the website and clicks off numerous, every second, a homophobic remark is being made in uh, some form of communication on social networking. Let's take a look at the other factor, school safety and peer victimization. You can see by the stats that overwhelmingly LGBTQ kids feel unsafe uh, at school. Almost three out of four were verbally harassed, and more than a third were actually physically harassed, which is being pushed or shoved. But if you take a look, almost one out of five were physically assaulted, and that involves more violent interactions, like being punched, being kicked, or injured with a weapon. Cyberbullying, one out of two LGBT kids report being bullied in social networking. And we talked about how important uh, Facebook communications are and how important that now Facebook has as a content issue a way for you to report any comment that appears on a wall. Am I using that right? If someone writes uh, a comment that you are concerned about, you can send that comment back to Facebook. And Facebook will write you. They have recently uh, expanded their service in terms of they ask, do you want to reach out to this individual? And if you want to reach out to this individual, here are materials that can help you. Do you want us to reach out to this individual? Um, and if so, these are the materials that we're going to provide. So pretty soon, thanks to the hard work of young people in America, we're going to have an app for everything. Some of the research was alarming. Bisexual and questioning youths had higher rates of suicidal ideation and attempts than those kids that identify as LGBT. The T in LGBT, transgender students. Um, they experience increased harassment and physical threat. And the more uh, that we grant greater access to transgender youth, transgender youth who identify um, uh, as a male, want to try out for male sports teams, want to go into male locker rooms, want to use male bathrooms. This is going to be a very difficult step for America to grasp as the more I present on it and see the reactions of people in my audience. But when we take a look at transgender youth and their experience, 42% are prevented from using um, the preferred name 
uh, more than half were required to use bathroom of their legal sex and not their identified sex. And almost a third were prevented from wearing clothes that identified with their preferred sex. Gender-based bullying affects everyone, even non-gay youth who are targets of anti-gay bias demonstrate greater levels of emotional distress and depression than kids who actually identify. So um, kids will tease on every possible angle in the schools, and it is harmful to everyone. Here is the disappointing part, though, is that a tremendous amount of kids, uh, more than half, ref you know, will not um, feel safe going to anybody on staff because they are afraid that uh, the person will not intervene. And even for those that were brave enough to approach a staff, uh, own, uh, uh, more than 30 percent or more than one out of three uh, did not have that staff member advocate for them. So there is a lot of fear in schools. So what are schools to do? This is a, a very you know, powerful slide that could be an all-day kind of training. But here are the big picture items for the school. First, identifying comprehensive policies and procedures where we can spell out definitions. And as Scott mentioned, we need to be able to have um, consequences spelled out for those that bully others in school. There has to be immediate uh, uh, reaction from staff to follow through. We need an inclusive curriculum, a, an inclusive curriculum that uh, includes the achievements of LGBT individuals in America, writers and, and colleges, as well as uh, all individuals that have contributed to the growth of America. In order to do this in schools, we need total buy-in from staff. Uh, everybody needs to get involved on a school campus, and in LAUSD, we have a card. This is our program, Out for Safe Schools. And when all the teachers in, uh, uh, at a particular school wear this along with their identification, kids know that this is a teacher that I can go to. Very often, this is a teacher that I will hang out with during the breaks uh, when we're out on the campuses where bullying can take place. But we all know the statistic that bullying will not take place within 10 feet of an adult. Okay, So through this program, total buy-in from the staff can be very effective. Um, and we need to build social networks for kids at school. Scott talks about all the research that supports connectedness at school. And one of the ways to build those social networks is to establish gay, straight, alliances. Gay Straight Alliance, the GSA club, is um, a social club for gay and straight kids to provide a social setting for them. But what I found was the power of the, uh, these alliances to help us learn from kids themselves on how to make our own uh, schools safer. So they can use the GSA network as a platform for activism and advocacy at the school. And you can find it at gsanetwork.org. And we've also included some recommendations for teachers that uh, for all teachers out there, I hope as a result of watching the module, you will go back to your school and see, do we have model policies and procedures in place? And if not, we want teachers to advocate to get those policies written. Um, we want teachers to ask for training. I want to know how best to intervene when I see bullying going on in my classroom. What am I to do? Who do I go to on staff? And what will I expect them to do as well? Because we want teachers, every time they hear something that's negative in their classroom uh, and harming an individual, to move quickly to intervene. 
We want teachers to learn about the resources that exist out there, resources like the Trevor Project that provides a hotline to schools, resources like the Jason Foundation that offers uh, modules uh, and other forms of teacher training, very important forms of, of how teachers, what is the role of the teacher in suicide prevention and bullying prevention. Uh, teachers need to set the climate in the school and they need to um, react immediately and treat all forms of bias related harassment and slurs as serious and preventable. Now I'm going to turn it back to Scott. While he makes his way up, here we have uh, a list of the federal laws that protect all LGBT students. These laws have been on the books for many, many, many years. Scott? Thank you very much, Rich. And moving along, common strategies. That was something I was emphasizing earlier. Reaching out to these students and to their families, educating everyone about the warning signs of suicide, as well as the prevalence and the problem of bullying. So the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention also weighed in, and these comments are very similar to those from the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. The relationship between bullying and suicide is complex. The relationship does exist. There is a strong association. Bullying alone does not cause somebody to be suicidal. We have to recognize millions of children in America get bullied every single day. Thankfully, very few of them actually die by suicide. We want to keep that in perspective, but unfortunately, some of them do die by suicide. And in a few minutes, we're going to turn to the prevention and protective factors for young people. But really important to recognize that connection don't just have bullying prevention programs, have a suicide prevention program as well. Particularly at the high school level, this is the age group we have absolutely the best data. It's called the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey. It's been done every two years since 1991. And let's just take the bottom figure there. Let's not talk about those that thought about it or made a plan. Let's talk about those that actually attempted. 8% of all high school students attempted in the last 12 months. So let's put that in the perspective of a high school of 1,000 students. What's that mean? 80 of them have attempted suicide in the last 12 months. Who's the most likely to attempt tomorrow? The kid with the previous history. Do you know what's really scary about this to me? Those 80 kids that I'm talking about in that, in that high school, the parents have no idea, for the most part, about their suicide attempts. Their teachers have no idea. They didn't sit down with the school counselor and talk about it. But who would know all about their friend's suicide attempt? Their, their peers and their friends, absolutely. They know all about it. Yet we're afraid to talk to young people about what to look for and what to do. In fact, I know the Jason Foundation stresses, kids are wondering why aren't the adults talking to us about this problem of suicide that we're encountering frequently with our classmates and friends. So I'm always going to be for more dialogue about suicide prevention. And I truly believe that it is everyone's responsibility. We could spend hours, and Rich and I could tell you what we believe the role of the school is. But I'm going to try to summarize it for you very quickly. Everybody that works in a school, from the custodian to the principal, needs to know the warning signs of suicide, needs to know look, what to look for, what to do, don't ever keep a secret. And that training, in my opinion, needs to be done every single year. Sometimes the principal would say to me, oh, come on, Scott. You talked to the high school staff about this last year. You don't need to do it again. Would well, you have any idea how many new staff members a massive high school would get every year? Yes, we do need to do it again. I know it can't be something where you give me eight minutes. 
we need to ha have time devoted to this. And then very importantly, counselors, social workers, school psychologists, they're going to be the person that the suicidal student is referred to. So they have to have training beyond awareness. They must know suicide assessment. They need to know the resources in the communities. Some of our states, Florida where I reside, has the Baker Act. And the Baker Act team can come out, make an assessment, and they might do involuntary hospitalization. But not every state has programs like that. And then very importantly, we need to keep up with the literature. In just a moment, I'm going to talk about what I believe have been some of the greatest advances in suicide prevention. And we need to know our community. We need to know our regional and our state resources. I recently, along with my wife, worked on a plan for the state of Texas schools, suicide safer schools in Texas. And I would have to acknowledge when I worked there, I probably wasn't as knowledgeable as I should have been about the regional and state initiatives that could have supported our school suicide prevention effort. So it's really all about collaboration. And I believe that every school district needs a suicide prevention expert, somebody that's gone to conferences, they've got training, they're leading the intervention in their school district. And then I also recommend that if you go to a school district website and you put in the word depression or suicide, if you're a parent or a community member, something should come up directing you to what's the school district doing, what are the signs of depression. And all the time I find adults that have trouble separating, oh, they think it's just typical teenage behavior. Oh, they're irritable, they're withdrawing, they're preparing me for they're gonna be gone to college next year. Well, there's a couple of key words. Is this pervasive? Is this affecting all aspects of their life? It's affecting school, it's affecting social relationships, it's affecting family rela relationships. And is it pervasive, not only in terms of those things, but is it persistent? Is this something that has gone on for two or three weeks or more? And have they dropped out of what used to be pleasurable activities? Oh, she loved dance. She participated for years. All of a sudden, she doesn't want to be on a dance team anymore. So you've got pervasive, persistent, pleasurable activities are no longer working. You need to get adult professional help for that child. And the school and the parents need to be working together. So keeping up with the best practices is really important. But I'd like to take a moment and talk about depression screening, a program called SOS. I'm on their advisory board, Signs of Suicide, Depression Screening for Middle School and High School Students. SOS has two components, a video. I love the video. Nobody dies in the video. People intervene and identify your suicidal sister, your friend, your student, and you get help for them. The video has a really simple acronym, ACT, Acknowledge, Care, Tell. And then there's a short questionnaire that the middle school and high school kids fill out about energy level, joy of life, thoughts of depression and suicide. They turn it over and they score it. And they know immediately whether or not they need to get help from the mental health professional today. Those protective factors that I alluded to earlier, these come from the World Health Organization. Youth suicide is a worldwide problem. So what are the protective factors? Stability and cohesion in our family. Well, that's easy for me to say, but think of all the families where there's been a divorce or separation. And what has to happen in our family is that mom and dad are going to be partners forever raising this child. And they can never put that young person in the middle. You ever had an eight-year-old kid say something like, I bet if I'd have done better in third grade, my daddy had never left our family. 
how do we make sure they understand it has nothing to do with their behavior? This was about the relationship between mom and dad. And dads have to stay involved. When dads are involved, healthier, happier, better achieving, better adjusted kids. And they need problem and coping skills. They need to recognize that whatever comes along, I'm going to get the help I need, and I'm going to be OK, because I'm a good person. A lot of that positive self-work comes from the home. I can honestly tell you with our children, never called a name, not in their entire life. Certainly, they made poor choices and misbehaved at times. But their misbehavior was always separated from their worth as a person. My love for them was never in question. And being successful in school academically, being involved in extracurricular things, whether it's band, whether it's drama, whether it's football, all of those are very protective. And obviously, we hope that every kid has good relationships with other young people. But one of the problems that we've seen over the years, if you're a kid with a lot of problems, who are you likely to turn to for help? I'm going to argue you're going to turn to a kid that has just as many problems as you do. And between two or three of you, you don't know enough to get a teacher, a counselor, an assistant principal, the pastor at the church involved. And worldwide, taking away access to lethal means. Number one method in America is still a gun. I've had conversations with parents where, unfortunately, they would not follow my advice and remove the gun from their home. I have a note that a suicidal teenager left for her parents that said, why did you make it so easy? Why did you leave this gun available to me? And I'm not here to question anybody's gun ownership. But when somebody tells you you have a troubled, depressed, impulsive, substance abusing, suicidal person right in your own home, it would make sense to me that you would remove the lethal means. Barriers on bridges around the world, they work. Suicides decrease. I had a chance to present in Taiwan not long ago. In Taiwan, it's not guns, it's pesticides. So they have to remove the pesticides and make sure they're not accessible to a depressed, suicidal person. And access to mental health care, knowing the resources in our schools and community, and doing things as simple as increasing the social workers in our schools, increasing counselors in our schools. I ask our own youngest daughter, would you actually, would you go talk to your counselor at your high school if you had a personal problem? What do you think she said to me? No, no Dad. I mean, if I wanted out of my advanced placement history class, I'd have to go talk to her. But to talk to her about personal things? I'm sorry, I don't see her that way. But when you're one to 700 kids, how can they possibly see you as somebody who can really spend time and talk with them about problems? Or if you're a school psychologist, one to 2,000 students, the chances that you're actually going to provide mental health services beyond one simple meeting are very unlikely to happen. So we've got to increase these services in our schools and community. And religion is a very important protective factor, whether it's a mosque, whether it's a synagogue, or it's the church. And most of all, we want that school environment to be one that promotes wellness, social, emotional health. It can't be all about the academics only. And again, we want to make sure every single kid feels connected to their schools. So a couple of final thoughts are, yes, there's a strong association between bullying and suicide. We have to work on both of those things in our schools and communities. That association is the strongest for the GLBTQ youth. And they must be supported. As you heard earlier, that support can make all the difference in the world. And so important that there is family acceptance. And then we do need to increase our supervision in our schools and find out 
where are the locations that bullying most occurs. Simplest thing we could do in a school, survey our students. Let's find out, is there a problem with bullying here? Do you feel connected to the teachers? Um, are you aware of classmates that are depressed and suicidal? How can we make our school safer, really? All we have to do is ask them, and we're going to know exactly what we need to work on as we improve our policies and protocols. There are a number of resources here that we want to emphasize. The federal program, Stop Bullying Now. There is the Bystander Revolution as well. There are uh, Welcoming Schools, which is all about supporting GLBTQ youth. And many other resources. Glisten was already mentioned. Gray, gay, straight, lesbian school education network. Lots of progress. But I want to be honest in saying that where I worked, a lot of people representing these wonderful organizations approached the school district. And we want to make sure that the school doesn't basically turn them away. So we recognize the association between bullying and suicide, the prevalence of bullying, and unfortunately, the incidence of youth suicide. And I hope in some small way, Rich and I's comments have been helpful to anybody viewing this program. And again, we're very happy to be a part of the excellent efforts of the Jason Foundation. And as far as the last, I have a couple of last thoughts myself as Scott was presenting. As we are empowering faculty uh, across America to mobilize for suicide prevention, very often um, uh, the teacher will refer the student to the crisis team, the school counselor, social worker, school psychologist, or nurse to follow through. But I always strongly urge the teacher to join the crisis team for that student to determine what's in the very best interest of that student because as far as I am concerned, the teacher is the one that really has the perspective on the student that has seen the student over the course of the year. We maintained a hotline to the school in LAUSD, not for depressed students, but for crisis team members that might need immediate assistance. And when a teacher would say to me over this phone, you know, this behavior is not like this child at all, that would just jump out at a hotline operator, a sudden change in behavior. So we're encouraging faculty not just to refer students, but to become part of it. Another thought I had in terms of creating safe places in school, when I was working in a high school, my principal assigned me to stand supervision. And for a long time, I referred to it as stupid vision. I will be honest with you. However, what I learned was how important it was to the kids that I worked with to know every day I was going to be in this area. So not only could they feel safe in the area from bullies, but they could also feel free to connect with me. You can't underestimate a single interaction you make with a student to empower them. And my very last thought is for faculty watching outside of Tennessee. Um, I want you to take a look to see if you're one of the 16 states that has the Jason Flat Act. The Jason Flat Act, which the home here in Tennessee, provides mandated training for school staff on a regular basis. And I think that is incredibly important. I remember once an administrator said to me, after a few years and they were trying to cut my program, they would say, hasn't everybody been trained yet? As if one presentation you know, would be enough to empower everyone. We need to continue to talk about it. And I thank you once again very much for your attendance today. Thank you.